Yes, kia ora whanau. welcome back to another episode here on Run It Straight, round 20. What an absolute cracker weekend of rugby league. Our boys are still in Samoa, so we got Esther, who's Yo. normally sitting over there, and Dills, who's at the back there. They're normally here, but they're in Samoa, and then we've got, obviously, the man himself, Willie. Look at him go. He's excited for this one. Morning up. <laughs> Pumped, pumped, what a it's, round. And it's great to see you guys, man. What a round of uh, round 20 of rugby league. Some absolutely crackers out there, guys, man. Willie, you would have been enjoying those ones. Ezra and bro, you fellas over in Samoa. Give us something, man. Give us something over there. Hey, our games usually disconnect <laughs> four times during the coverage throughout the, throughout the game. But we still try and watch them. But, but, like, but like what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bro, what about our man's uh, man shit over there? What's up with that? Oh, bro, he's, yeah, he's a heavy hater, this fellow, Ray. He's out. a heavy hater, this guy. Chucking on the Canberra Raiders, bro. Get out of here. Last week, New South. This week, he's got bloody Canberra Raiders And you on. took, you packed that in your bag just in case, hey, this happened. That's why yeah, you took it with I you. <laughs> That's but, how much yeah. of a hater you are. Ah, oh, well, right. Right. let's um, let's kick it off, eh? Let's kick it off and get through this, yeah. Ephraim. What do we got, brother? <laughs> let's Before just move quickly off. Oh, yeah. Straight away, eh? Straight away. <laughs> let's move on quickly. <laughs> All right, so starting off the news of the week, we've got um, Robbie Farah being, or the club, the Tigers, deciding to part ways with Robbie Farah. Seems like uh, they're going to be targeting a more experienced coach to go behind Benji and help him out maybe rescue this season, but more likely get better for next season. Yeah, yeah, no, I, th- I think that was pretty big news for the West Tigers. Um, obviously, there's a, a good connection down there with Benji, obviously Robbie, uh, Chris Hyntons out there. Um, so they've all played together. Um, but again, something hasn't worked for the club this year. Um, not playing their... Be- oh, they're playing and patches playing some really quality football, but just not consistent enough with their performances. So um, something had to change. Whether Robbie's walked away from it or Benji's tapped him on the shoulder and said, "Oh, we need a, a new uh, a restructure or an experienced coach to come along with them and help him and guide him into 2025." Um, I think Benji needs someone, Willie, that's gonna um, challenge him or someone that's got real good knowledge of the game. I'm not saying Benji doesn't have good knowledge of the game, but someone with a bit of experience in the game of rugby league. Yeah, I I thought it was a strange appointment mm. to start with uh, by mere fact that rookie coach, very little experience coaching. He'd spent some time under Tim Sheens uh, when Sheensy was coaching the side and he was trying to beat Benji through. Mm. Benji's... When he got that opportunity to be the head coach, he needed to surround himself with some experience, yeah. some knowledge around coaching, because there's a craft to it. And appointing his mate and Robbie Farrow and then Chris Hinington just was a real surprise to me that he's surrounded himself by people, yes, that are invested in the club and love the badge and emotionally have an attachment to the joint, but he needed some experienced people around him, not, not just tactically, but management-wise, yeah. making decisions and how to run the club and had a background in coaching. So I'm not really surprised that this has happened. I think if, if it is Benji, I think it's a very brave and smart move mm. from him to want to hopefully bring some experience in. The next move will be important. Yeah. They've got John Morris, yeah. who did really well at Cronulla and been around the game, a 300-gamer as a player, but he's done his apprenticeship as a coach. Mm. So when you're coaching, you've got to have people that are going to challenge you, you know, with their opinions and they see things a little bit differently. It's, when you're sitting in that chair as the head coach and you're overseeing stuff, you don't see everything. Yeah. You're, the players keep things to themselves sometimes, and the, which means the assistant coaches, they're privy to a lot of things. Mm. and Players will go to them yes. more so than to you. And if your assistant coaches have a fear and don't understand their role is to bring that information to mm. you, then you're not coaching as well as you could do. So an experienced assistant coach, an experienced person in coaching would be great for Benji coming in. 
I think there'll be some movement on the coaching market mm. as the season goes on, so there'll be plenty for him to choose from. I, I think defensively they've got to find someone that's a, a strong defensive coach or strong-minded defensive coach because, geez, they can leak some points, but they can also score some points as well. And if you think of both Benji and Robbie and maybe John Morris, they're all, I think they're all attacking coaches and they're real smart when it comes to tactical, tactically, when it comes to the game of rugby league attack, they can see things they've played in those positions before. But I think f for them, and you've seen with Cameron Serraldo, um, the defence normally can win you games. And if they can get someone that's strong defensively, or strong-minded defensively, I think they could hold them in good stead moving forward because they'll need a strong preseason after what they've yeah. been able to do this year. Yes, Benji's had a nearly had a season under his belt. I like it. I think, you know, having more experience around him as an, a more experienced coach, but a, a defensive-minded coach that will challenge Benji both on and off the ball, I think that would work perfectly for the Tigers. Yeah, and defence is a toughness, and toughness is a culture. Mm. And they're a very young side. Yeah. And I think uh, I've been critical of them this year, and what I've seen the last two weeks, mm. especially... Is there a young, exciting team? Yeah. The future is pretty bright for yeah. this side. If they can keep Utuka Manu yeah. um, to go with Galvin, Jareen Buller, and uh, the Fainu brothers, yeah. you know, they've got some young talent there that are in their infancy. Yeah. But they need the guidings, the guidance of some experience around them as well as Benji's know-how and knowledge. Yeah, well, if you don't have some senior players on the field, then having a senior coach around there that's done it before that knows what it is. Because like you said, those young kids, man, they can play some footy. Um, their game on the weekend was exciting until obviously it got to the end there and they lost another player and then they go on and lose the game. But they can score points. That's a that's a Benji Marshall attacking side yep. right there. Like they're attacking from anywhere on the field and they're playing some footy. But the defensive side is the other part where they got to get right. So, yeah, I think it's a great move from Benji to be able to try and strengthen his stocks and the coaching to help and guide him moving forward for sure for the Tigers. So do, you comes guys, in do you guys have any suggestions, anyone on the open market for coaches at the moment for the Tigers? No, I, I, don't know, I don't know who would want to, like, who wants to sit behind Benji Marshall if you're an older coach, you know what I mean? Like, that's, I guess that's the challenge is if you're a coach, say, if you're like a Brad Arthur, are you confident in sitting behind Benji Marshall as an assistant? Um, are those are the questions that those people will have to answer and try and think if they want to be able to do it because Benji can be this a, a different person he's you know he's really opinionated he knows what he wants he knows where he wants to go whether he wants someone that's going to be hard and go no Benji this is where we want to go or they are comfortable sitting behind Benji that's much the question the hardest question to answer because of that reason I think sitting behind a young coach yeah and we had Dave Ferner there and yeah. it sounds like there was a little bit of a clash between those two and Fernsey is an experienced old head mm. that may have challenged him and yeah. um, whether Benji was comfortable with that or not. He may have learned from that experience. One of the challenges now for the Tigers in their recruitment of, a, of an assistant coach is Melbourne are looking for an assistant coach too. Yeah, yeah. Jason Riles is leaving, mm. going to Paris, so they've got a spot open. The top candidate, if Craig Bellamy wants him, is probably going to go there. Yeah. If the opportunity arises. But yeah. there, as I'm saying, they're a young side, they're an exciting side for the future. There is a real good challenge there. If somebody wants to get their hands on it and take it, there's an opportunity to take a side with a, almost mm. a blank canvas and build something up with Benji. Well, well, there's more upside to the kids that they have than downside, eh? Defensively, like you can start building a culture around mental toughness or resilience because they're so young and they haven't been taught. So they're more open to actually the challenge. So if someone wants to come in there and challenge them, I am reckon they'll jump on board and take it with a grab or two hands because the tech's all there. We've seen it all. Just offensive stuff there, I think. But again, like you said, blank canvas. These kids are young. There's 18-year-olds in there. Chuck them in there. Chuck them in the deep end and see if they swim. 100%. Move along to uh, news on the Panthers next year. Obviously, their stadium... Blue Bet is getting rebuilt, renovated. They're going to get a massive one, surely. Uh, uh, and so for next season, they need to play at other stadiums. So eight of their home games are going to be at Combank. I'm sure the Eels will love that. Uh, and then the other four will be the Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, 
uh, Glen Willow Regional Sports Complex in Mudgee, Carrington Park in Bathurst, and then a home game for Magic Round at Suncorp. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Well, if you're moving away from your, your stadium, pretty much don't have too many options than what you've just said. So I think that the country ones are a good one for me. I think if you're a team that already takes games to the country, you know, like Penrith do, uh, Bathurst, I think why not give more to the communities out there because a lot of their kids would come through those pathways anyway. So a great decision, I think, from Penrith to still keep those games out in the country. And then obviously Combank there, um, a great stadium. Yes, it's, you know, every other club's playing their home games there as well. So didn't really have to, it's closer to Penrith, um, you know, I just think that the country ones for me is is great for Penrith Panthers to be able to give back to the community, which they would already do anyway through all their pathways, but an opportunity for some of those uh, kids out in the country to rub shoulders and touch some of the idols. Yeah, I'm so I'm excited for what they come up with as far as their new stadium mm. and Parramatta Stadium uh, got revamped into Combank now and it's nothing like what it was. It's yeah. Yeah. modern, it's new. It's Good. new age and it's outstanding. Um, hopefully Penrith are able to develop yeah. something like that and for the success that they've enjoyed over the last four years, making four grand finals in a row, winning three, they deserve mm. a new age stadium. The game as a whole and people within the game want to keep, like Leichhardt, the suburban stadiums, mm. but we want the modern feel to it as well. So we've got to develop some of those stadiums and this is what Penrith are doing. I don't think it'll hurt too much being away from there for a season. And as you said, Vegas, excited. Country, excited. Mm. Magic weekend. Big, big, big turnaround for them. They'll be filthy on losing to the Warriors this year. Yep. They want to make amends for that. So there's motivation there. I think they'll do all right with being away from their home ground for a season. They'll, uh, they'll come back to a fresh new one, which they'll turn into a fortress, no yep. doubt. Well, the reward is what they've been able to create over the last four or five years or last six, seven years, and for their fans for turning up and showing the care and uh, for, for them out on the field, you know, tr selling out their stadium at, at, at Penrith there. So to be able to get something special and big and better, it only adds more spice and more fans coming in the gates and helping Penrith keep growing the, the bloody massive train that it is, you know. So I think it's it's awesome that... They're getting a new stadium. It's awesome for their fans because they'll keep turning up, but they'll be able to fit more in there now. And I think that game only grows. For me, I think they're going to be there right at the end again. So to be able to be playing, you know, I think they'll go to the finals again. You know, five grand finals in a row, like, that's enormous. But it's also a reward for their fans for getting behind them and what they've been able to do as a club, the success that they've had. I think also it's the final piece to them becoming a machine. Oh. They've, uh, they've always had... The fan base, they've had the area, they've had the money through their leagues club, which has always been the biggest. Then they built that bigger, big training facility, mm. which was state of the art oh. for its time and probably the one that led other clubs to follow. Yeah, They've had the team success on the field. The stadium is the next bit. They become this mm. one almighty machine yeah. that the NRL will look at. They're setting the standards and everything. Yeah, and then players want to go there. For you sure. Know, like... It's mostly a hard place for people to go out in Penrith if you're a Sydney club, when a Sydney player, because there's a lot of other clubs just in the area. So if you've got the state-of-the-art facilities and they're attracting big players, which they don't normally because they've got all these pathways, you know, they're bringing all their talent through. But you're more likely to, when you go to the market, if you're looking for a key player, they're going, Penrith is firstly on my list because of the success that they've had, but also their facilities and what they've been able to do over the years. So, mate, it's a, it's a big win for Penrith, for sure. Do you guys think, so obviously they have those four games uh, that aren't at Combank. Bathurst, as you said, a nice gesture, I guess. I kind of feel like it's pretty stupid that Sydney teams especially get counted as a home game for Magic Round when it's at Suncorp. Like this season, for example, when the Broncos played the Sea Eagles, it was the Sea Eagles home game at Suncorp because it was Magic Round. I feel like they just need to sort of just say that's a neutral game instead of calling it a yeah. home game because it's a bit of a joke. Well, yeah, I think the only difference is, is that you get the home dressing rooms, 
and the other team gets the away dressing room. So there's a big difference <laughs> when it comes to the home and away at Suncorp Stadium. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't. I think you've got a great point. Uh, mutual mutual stadium, mutual grounds. <laughs> Damn, giving them more <laughs> ammo. Um, just to like you know, everyone turns up and you you just you coin toss and you're the you're the away changing rooms, you're the home changing rooms. I think that's how it should work. But again, it's the same thing with every other team. You know, they all. I think you choose if you want it to be your home game or away game. I think someone like the Warriors would say what they'd want it to be a away game because they get another home game back in New Zealand. You know what I mean? So it all depends on the club and what they want to do if they want to take their home game to. Uh, Suncorp, or they want to keep one for themselves and have it back here, say for the Warriors, for example, here at Go Media. That's the only difference for me. Yeah, and I don't know if there's something with the league when they do the fixtures and they come out with it that you've got to have so many home games mm. and so many away games. And, you know, if you've committed to the away games, then they might have to sacrifice one of them being your home games. But, yeah, like Adam says, you know, the benefit is you get the home dressing room, which... Yeah. You know, whether that makes a difference or not. But, yeah, mere technicality, I think. But, uh, yeah, well, the clubs must have some sort of say in it. All right, we'll move on to the last bit of news for the week. Bit of previewing because, uh, finally, for all, I know we have some fans that are NRLW fans uh, that watch Run It Straight. So it, the season's finally starting for the ladies on Thursday at, 8.45 Australian Eastern, 10.45 New Zealand time. With the Knights versus the Roosters, the winners of the last three premierships, so a big opening game. And then Sharks versus Cowboys, Broncos versus Eels, Dragons versus Titans, Tigers versus Raiders. Are you guys excited for NRLW action? Oh, I'll tell you what, 10.45 on a Friday night, bro, like, let's just be real honest. Let's be real honest here. I don't know if I'm going to be staying up. I don't know if I'm going to be staying up for a 10.45 game here in New Zealand. So I'm just being pretty straight here on Run It Straight that I don't think I'll be up at 10.45 on a Friday night here in New Zealand. But I think it's exciting that the game's back on um, for our women that have been training the house down through the preseason. The season's about to come for them, so they'll be excited to start on Thursday night and then all through to the to the final series. Um, obviously, Newcastle won won the grand final, so what a way to kick it off! Are they still got their coach? Is Ronnie still their coach? No, they've got uh, Ben Jeffries. So they've got a, obviously got a new coach coming in. It'll be nice to see if how they <coughs> the style of football they're going to play. Um, so, yeah, I reckon it's a, a great opportunity for the women to get back into the game. Um, some of the new signings coming to the clubs, uh, that'll be exciting. Some of the rugby sevens women coming into the, cl into the clubs as well. Be exciting to see what the Broncos do with some of their signings. Um, obviously, the Gold Coast with some of the rugby stars up there. So, exciting all around for the game for the NRLW. It's an exciting start. Um, it's only going to get better as the year goes on. Um, looking forward to seeing glimpses won't be on a Friday night at 10.45, that's all. <laughs> yeah, we've spoken about uh, how it's gone from strength to strength, the, the NRLW, and no doubt this will be the biggest and best season so far. Um, as you said, Newcastle have got a new coach, Ben Jeffries, who was with the Cowboys and who was the Queensland Women's Origin coach um, and Papua New Guinea coach. Yep. He's gone to the Knights and invested... And spent a bit of money, so no doubt they're going after another title, but the Roosters will have a big say. We've already seen the season unofficially start with Origin mm. and how exciting that three-match series was. I reckon the girls will be pumped and primed after a tough pre-season to get going this weekend and, and get it underway. I'm really excited for what the season's going to bring. I uh, really started watching it last year mm. and was really impressed by some of the talent and calibre of footy that was played. And no doubt that's going to go up a gear again and excited for the Warriors to come in mm. the year after. But, yeah, 10.45, I'll be watching. I'll be there. I'll watch this. I'll have a look. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no, excited to get going. Why yeah, are you lying start. for? Hey? Why are you lying for? Because I'm going to go watch the Warriors <laughs> play the Tigers and then go watch the girls oh, after. Oh, actually, yes. Now, 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 you, now you say <laughs> that, really. Now you say that. Hold on a minute, guys. I'll take that one back. The Warriors play on Friday night. I'm going to be up till bloody godly knows of the time of the night, so we might be able to watch them. 
Are we so following the game now? is at 10.45 <laughs> on Thursday. Thursday. No, sorry. <laughs> Oh, Thursday. Thursday, oh. say, Willie, Willie. Oh, Take that back. Yeah. <laughs> i got to work Friday morning. Boy, you got to work, say, early morning for everyone. School drop-offs. All the best, girls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be a great, great it'll be season. Another, it'll, be a, it'll be an awesome seven, season of NRLW anyway, guys. If we go off the back of what we saw in Origin level um, and all the new signings, be awesome. Can't wait for it. I have another interesting question, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure has been asked before, but... Why are they called the Cowboys in the NRLW? Shouldn't they be the Cowgirls? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> well, I guess you're on the back of the Cowboys. Is it just me or, like... <laughs> well, they play under that banner. Yeah, yeah, they play under the Cowboys banner. They play banner. under the Cowboys banner. It's like the Roosters. Yeah. Newcastle. The Knights. Knights. Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, but a rooster's an animal. Yeah, I, I know what you're trying to say. Does it sound funny, though, Cowgirls? <laughs> well, when... I mean, it's just weird when you, like, last season watching some of their games and Emma Manzelman has scored for the Cowboys. Oh, okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being an egg. I'm being an egg. <laughs> You're okay. clutching at some point. The the NRL. NRL. Yeah. <laughs> You're tossing one up there. Yeah. 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 Just something oh, to talk about. Stirring trouble, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stirring, stirring trouble. But, hey, yeah, maybe you got something there. Maybe. Well, maybe. speaking of stirring trouble... I'm going to stir up some more trouble because oh, the first NRL game of the weekend was the Raiders versus the Warriors. Up the Raiders. Mm. 2018 for them. Um, your guys' predictions. Adam, you said Warriors by eight. Willie, you said Warriors 24-20, which would have been correct if uh, Chanel had got his three extra kicks. Willie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is one that got away from the Warriors. I thought the Raiders did get off to a, a pretty good start. Mm. and But the Warriors, as they have done throughout the season, they fought back. They got themselves in position to win scoring three tries in a row. Then Xavier Savage scores. And I think that I thought, jeez, the game's gone here. Mm. But then Adam Fanua Blake responds with a try and an opportunity for Chanel to kick the goal. But unfortunately, he doesn't. But... Uh, it's sad that the young fella is coming for a lot of criticism, mm. but as a kicker, you take that responsibility on your shoulders. And, you know, Chanel's been great the last couple yeah. of weeks in stepping up in the absence of, obviously, Luke Metcalf and Sean Johnson. Him and Samaiti have been great in the halves, um, but the responsibility of kicking that goal just didn't work out for him on this occasion. But there's so many more moments in the game that are important to winning the game. It wasn't lost then. No. It wasn't just lost with that kick. They should have defended better to stop the Raiders from scoring mm -hmm. in the first place, but they had plenty of opportunities to score before that. You know, so and I just feel for Chanel. I'm sure he'll bounce back and he'll be bigger and stronger for that. You could see how disappointed he was afterwards, yeah. just walking Walked straight off. off the field in disappointment. But... Yeah, he'll, he'll understand his role and, and what his responsibility is as a kicker and he'll go back and practice and be ready for those moments when they come again. Yeah, plenty of, plenty of moments that... And I think this has been the Warriors' season that there's been moments in the game where they look at it and just go, oh, we could have just been better in that moment there and we could come up with a better result. A um, few errors coming off their line, um, an offload. I think Mitch Barnett said after the game that he takes responsibility for one of the offloads when the game was in the balance. I think Dallin come off the line, lost the ball. I think that moment where Savage scores that try, if both Ali and Roger had their time again, they would just go jump on that ball or yeah. try and whack it out. And I think there was a little bit of a communication issue there where they just didn't, no one knew what they were doing and someone's just got to get on the ball. So um, they were... The, the, the first half, I felt like, you know, if they got jumped on the back of their defensive efforts against the Bulldogs, they would have taken the game away from them in the first half. But they never came out with that same intent and intensity. Yes, they come off a bye. But at the same time, I thought, you know, the middle forwards for, for the Canberra Raiders punched straight through the middle of the Warriors at the start there, the first 20 minutes. And... They made inroads down there, got some easy tries just because they wanted it a little bit more. They looked like a team that was playing to be in the eight and the Warriors were just hanging on in that first, first 20, 25 minutes. 
Credit to the Warriors, and this has been their season, that they've hung in and managed to get a try just before half time and give themselves a chance to come back in the second half. They started really well in the second half. I thought the second half was all the Warriors. They were the better team in the end. Um, they should have won that game. Again, a game that got away from them. They should have won the Bulldogs game as well. If they look back on their season and there's been games that they should have won, that's where they'll go, we let that one go, we let that one go. Um, and again, they haven't played an 80 minute performance yet, I don't think. Um, and, you know, they've gone through so much adversity through the season. And like mo most other teams as well, and it's not just the Warriors, but they've had people in games that have fallen over and they've had to make shift so many back rowers. Kirk Catewell, Mitch Barnett, um, you know, Lika Haleasima, who's only just come into <laughs> the game, his second game of NRL, he's he's played in the centres both times now. And he's a he's a middle forward back rower playing in the centres. Lucky he's mobile and agile enough. So they've they've done it the hard way through a lot of these games that they've should have won. And if you look back and they go, man, if we won that game, it would be one of our better wins because of what's happened around them. You know, to lose your fullback after like, I guess, 15 minutes to a category one HI and then have to push Roger back, which is okay, because he goes, but what happens is everyone else is disrupted by moving people out. You lose your first choice kicker, uh, Adam Pompey, to a knee injury just before half time, and you're thinking, well, who's going to go play wing? I think they've done a good job with the adversity that they've had, but not a good enough job to win the games. And, and then we talk about, obviously, Chanel with his kicking. I've seen him kick goals from the sideline at Go Media Stadium and hit them just as nice as any other kick in the competition. Um, he had an off night, you know what I mean? He had yeah. an off night. Um, he wouldn't be happy. Like you said, you, that's, you take personal responsibility as a goal kicker to hit those goals. He didn't look comfortable in that last goal kick. Um, he's he was obviously not happy with how he was kicking and maybe overcompensated for the kick and missed it. Again, when we talk about the hate, like undeservedly, he doesn't need to be getting the hate. Yeah. I think, like you said, Willie, um, moments in the games that the Warriors should have been able to capitalise and take the game away from the Canberra Raiders, it shouldn't always come down to a goal kick and those kind of moments. But as a kicker, that is your job to get those kicks. Um, you know, it's easy for people to sit back behind a keyboard and 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 give him some hate and, and tell him that he's much the worst kick in the comp and all these things. But they're quick to forget when he's kicked goals, he's actually got all his goals beforehand. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just think these people just need to chill out a little bit. Um, it's not nice that, you know, if it's your son or your brother or, or anyone else's cousin and there's people giving him shit for what he's done, I think, man, you put the boot on and see if you can kick a goal that close to that in, in those situations, you know what I mean? So, unfortunate for the Warriors because now this becomes every game from now on is a must win. They can't lose. They can't lose, can't lose, and you don't want to be putting it in the hands of other teams, but that's where it's gone now. So, they've got to win every single game. They've got one bye at the end of the season. May help them because it puts them on 21 points now if they were to take that bye right now. But every game's a must win, and um, let's hope that they can bounce back after this one and build some confidence and finish off real strong of the season. There's a couple of things. Uh, I think Roger going to fall back and then coming up with that try awesome. just proves to me that's his spot. That's his position. He's a runner. He's a fullback with the ball in his hands. He's so dangerous. You know, he just got the ball on the sweep line and just straightened up, saw yep. the hole. He's got to get it around those defenders that are moving laterally and he's asking questions Yeah. because a lot of times people can't come up with the right no. answer. He's shown that time and time again throughout his career, but when he's gone back to fullback for the Warriors, um, the Warriors, the difficulty for them now, yeah, they have to win every single game, but they're in that position which nobody wants to be in where they're relying on results. Yeah. They're relying on other people's results and looking at other games, hoping they lose and hoping they beat them, which is never a position you want to be in. But unfortunately, such has been their season. Um, there's still a chance. There's yeah. a glimmer of hope. But as you said, they never wanted to get to it, but everyone's a must-win now. For the Raiders, you mentioned about their middles. I thought Joey Taps, yeah. Joey Tarpany and, and Josh Papali, I thought it was their best Huge. game as a tandem. Huge. Together for the season. The two of them together, carrying the ball dangerously yeah. through the middle. And then off the back of that, it allowed Jamal Fogarty to be dangerous. Oh. First game back for a long, long time, Jamal Fogarty. Yeah. His kicking game, his running game, uh, showed the Raiders how important he is to their team. Mm. He opened up some space. 
for uh, for Kyle Weeks and for Ethan Strange. He was he was great down mm. the left hand side. Ethan Strange showing his pace, but he's just a foil. But when he gets it, he's dangerous. So, yeah, they pieced a few things together that haven't quite been working well. The Raiders and. They did enough to get the win. Well, they had intent. That's what they had. They had intent in everything that they were doing, those middle forwards. Yes, I said the Warriors come back in the second half, but Jamal Fogarty was the key and has been the key for the Raiders this year when he was playing. His kicking game is most probably right up there with Mitch Moses and Adam Reynolds. When he plays, he's he's an Adam Reynolds in the Brisbane Broncos, yep. but in the Canberra Raiders. When Adam Reynolds plays, the Brisbane Broncos win because he's the glue to yep. everyone else around him. So... I think before the game we heard um, Jordan Rappner speaking about you know what Jamal Fogarty brings to the game and what their game plan was to kick it to the Warriors' left-hand corner with Jamal's right foot kick, just putting it in the corner all day. But then on the back of that, causing some errors, playing their shape, having options, connecting with all those young players around the park and, and choosing the right option nine times out of ten. It's got the, one of the best kicking games in the yeah. comp as well. Um, so like, if they're going to go on the, the, the Canberra Raiders, he's a big part of... Of what they do, he brings confidence. Obviously, Kai Weeks at the back's been good for them. I think, man, he's been a revelation this year, anyway. Um, and their young halves have been good as well. So, uh, Canberra Raiders, if those two middle forwards can do what they've done in this game and keep pushing for the rest of the season, they'll give them a chance to play yep. in, play in the eight. But again, that that the eight, I think, fifths on twenty four points, and the Warriors are on nineteen right now. Just shows how qu- quite close and how competitive this competition is this year. Yep. You know what I mean? So. Everyone's still a chance, bar Tigers and Para. Para. I think mathematically, yeah. you know, Titans Warriors, uh, the two be- uh, two above them, are a chance mathematically. But like we said, they're going to be relying on teams above them to yeah. fall over, and they're going to have to win every single game. So yeah. the pressure's on for both those two teams and the guys just below the eight. But man. Um, there'll be one that they look back on and go, damn, we let that one go when uh, opportunity missed again. But for me, the, Willie, the, the, the question I've got to ask as well is, now they're down another, there's the centres, the centres, um, I don't know how long Marcelo Montoya's out, the wingers, like they're going to be looking for replacements again and this, I don't know how they keep finding these guys. Very lucky, very lucky that down in New South Wales Cup, they're sitting in a pretty good position now. They're third in the comp, in, in a tough competition down there as yeah. well. There is some young, good young kids down there, but I'm, I'm saying they're young. Yeah. They're young kids, and they'll have to debut a couple of those guys over the next couple of weeks if no one's coming back from the NRL squad. Yeah, well, the ones that, they've, that have had experience, and you don't want to have to do this really, but you may have to play Lika Halasima in, in the centre and Moana yeah. Graham Telfo on the wing. And Corsi's there as well. And Corsi will put... Put Graham Wala into centre, and then Ed Corsi on the wing, yeah. which they've been a, a partnership in reserve grade. Yeah, uh, I think they had that one game together. Yeah, in first grade. So, yeah, that may be forcing the hand of the coach yeah. to pick through that injury crisis. But the good thing is they've both stepped up when they've had, the, yeah. had their opportunity. Yeah, and yeah, I guess that's the challenge now is you're going to put some faith in these young young kids and and trust in the pathways that. The coaches below have been giving these guys the right tools to get to that to that level and push to be NRL players as well. And yeah, it's a, it's a challenging time for the Warriors as as a club and as players. Um, but it's a great opportunity for whoever steps in to get to be seen on the big stage and do a really good job under the tough circumstances that they've got to deal with for the next what seven six or seven weeks. For the injuries, um, so Tane and. Pompey, obviously TBC on them at the moment, but Marcelo is meant to come back next week. Sean might be back next week or the week after, uh, and C and K will be around 22 as well. So the week after, Rocco Berry's indefinite. Yeah. So maybe in the next couple of weeks they will start getting all these guys back from injuries. But as you guys said, good chance for those young guys. All right, we'll move on to the next game, eh? Rabbitohs versus Tigers at Industry Group Stadium, 42-28 to the Rabbitohs. Your guys' predictions, Adam, you said 34-6 to the Rabbitohs. Willie, you said 48-10 to the Rabbitohs. So maybe not giving the Tigers enough credit, because they did get yeah. some points, but they yeah, did yeah. still get smashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, um, I think it was the game was in the balance for a fair, bit, a fair chunk of that until... 
I guess, you know, the last maybe 15 minutes where the Rabbitohs just got away from the Tigers. Um, again, the story of the night for the Tigers is their sin binnings. And yes, uh, uh, you know, no one goes out there to do one of the tackles that Aiden Caesar did, but he gets he gets put in 10 minutes. And from there, I think, you know, that the, the Rabbitohs open everything up. Um, Tane Millen at the first half was most probably their most dominant player on the field. When they got the ball to him, he's been able to chuck offloads out of his bum to score tries for Adam, uh, Johnson on the wing. Um, but again, if you look at the, the Tigers, and we spoke about it earlier, there's some really good young kids in there. But the thing that you get with young kids is you get some really good stuff and then you get some really poor things uh, to the standard of NRL level. And some of the errors that they're all having on the back of some of these but passes that come out of backfield bounce on the ground and then the Rabbitohs pick the ball up and win and score tries. Those are some of the things that Benji would want to try and take out of the game. And I know I heard Benji talk after the game about he puts it on him to be able to coach these guys, to get them to understand what they need to do. Uh, but in the moment, um, there's some really good moments from those young kids and then some really poor moments when it comes to NRL level. And they were competitive for so much of the game and then... You know, it just gets away from them a little bit more experience. Maybe they'd be able to get that off. Aiden Caesar goes off the field. They lose someone of, a, of quality with his experience and his knowledge and his kicking game. And the Rabbitohs just take the game away from them because they were uh, a stronger, I think, more, uh, had a lot more leaders on the field to be able to get them home in the end. So, yeah, like a, a great attacking game of football. We would have set, put both of those teams in the category of scoring lots of points, but we didn't say that the Tigers were, but they did. Didn't give them enough credit, but a great game for both teams, as in can score points, but would be disappointed defensively. Both teams were disappointed de um, defensively. Yeah, South Sydney got off to a flyer through uh, Cody Walker. Yeah. was outstanding. Come up with a try. But fortunate off the grubber kick. He reads yep. it well and scoops it up. But Alex Johnson, the try scoring machine that he is, he's uh, edging himself ever closer to that Ken Irvine record. But I thought the try just before half time to Jareen Buller, fantastic break by mm. the Tigers down the left hand side with Lockie Galvin playing to the left to Lowly Lee. And then coming back inside, that try really got him back in the game. Mm. They were out of it. They were gone before that. They go in half time by that scoreline, then it could have been some demons in the speech, and it's a totally different speech for Benji Marshall after that try. They come out, they grow in confidence. Yeah. 20 minutes to go, they're leading. 28-24, yeah. South kicked the ball down. Jareen Baller tries Passes to play it. out of uh, yardage, and young Luke Lowley, he, he drops the ball. Cody Walker pounces and scores. They take the lead, and then it's, that's just compounded by Aiden Adam Caesar doing the hip drop and yeah. I think we we're saying he's, he's looking at three or four weeks already on top of, you know, some suspensions already for him this week. Yeah. Just Simbins seem to be week after week for the Tigers. Uh, the discipline, they can ill afford yeah. to be down. Because when the game's in the balance like that, the errors and then going down to 12 men, that's when South Sydney pounce. That's when teams have pounced against the Tigers late in games when they've gone down to 12 men. So... Yeah, it's, is it a fair reflection um, because they went down to 12 men? I still think so. Mm. I think the scoreline is still a, a fair reflection of how Souths were that much better yeah. than the Tigers. But as I said, there's something exciting about the Tigers going forward. Yeah. There's still something about them if, if they can get the right people around them. They're, they're building one important part. They could play footy. Yeah. If, as you said, if they can fix up and find some steel defensively and fix those errors and discipline up, they could be a very dangerous side in the years to come. Well, Jerome Luai jumps into that team. He's more of an attacking player as well, yep. so it only adds to Lockie Galvin and what he can do. Gee, that kid just wants to be on everything. Like, he's... I think in the first half, he was over 100 metres already in the first half of the way that he carries the ball. Like, he wants to take hit-ups. For a young kid, he's full of confidence and brave and does some really good things. So you add... Luai to that, it ends up being a really good attacking side uh, with some of the young talent coming through. Like we've both said, sort out the defensive stuff and some bright things at the Tigers moving forward. One of the bright stars too, um, Appy Coruscant, yeah. didn't play, Talon De Silva. Yeah. 
young hooker who started mm. the game, yep. set up a try for Galvin, scored one himself. He is good. He had a bright start to the game and looks like someone that uh, will need to keep an eye on because he's yeah. a good young hooker that came on with some spark. Yeah, well, they come over to New Zealand this this Friday night and play the Warriors. And again, like like we said, it's a must win. And both teams need to be better anyway. So it be a good challenge to see a, a real attacking side of football could be another high scoring game. That's it. Be, be a good game of footy. Mm. On the Rabbitohs side, um, Damien Cook played his 200th game for the Rabbitohs and he had a pretty mean game. Got shafted onto the kicking duties after last week's horror show Goal from kicking was Walker on. and Milne. And, you know, seven tackle breaks, two try assists, two offloads, 30 tackles. He moved out to centre for a bit. He was he was showing them a little bit maybe uh, why they should regret getting rid of him. Oh yeah, I, I think when when the teams were playing well around, especially the middle of the park, Damien Cook comes into his own. But it's like every hooker, like if your middle forwards are doing a good job, which the South Sydney guys are, Keon kelmatungi has been really dominant since his move to the middle of the park, and he carries the ball strong. He's got some good ball playing skills about him as well. So when those middle forwards are playing some really tough quality rugby league for the middle of the park, someone like Damien Cook can have a field day and. I thought he was really well. His running game is obviously second to none in the competition when he's running the ball. And obviously on the back of that, his goal kicking was on as well. And I heard the commentators talking like about his kicking and they were backing him every time because he was hitting them so well. And I thought he did a good job because I think the weekend before, they lost because of the goal kicking. They they scored more tries but managed. Uh, Cody Walker missed most of his kicks, you know. So they did a bit of a reshuffle there. He's obviously had some practice, bit of a goal kick in his time and... But all those kicks over, he was he was he had a solid performance. Yeah, the modern game isn't just about your talent and who you've got. It's there's a salary cap you've got to manage, and obviously they've got Wayne Bennett coming in next year, and obviously he's got some ideas around who he wants to play in, in the hooking position. Mm. Damien Cooks from around the Wollongong area, so he gets to go back home and play for his local club before he retires. And 200 games, fantastic achievement for him. And uh, he had a day out to celebrate that too with a win. Uh, just on what you said about Keon, Adam, how's this for a stat? So in the seven games he started at lock, he's only had one of them where he's run under 200 metres. Yeah. And his average metres per game is 224. Yeah, he's he's been busy, bro. He's been busy in the middle of the park. It's like he's he was he's a good player out in the back row, but I think he's been through the tough times that they had at the start of the season. His shift to the middle of the park, I'm guessing they were looking for some leadership around the middle of the park. They put him in the middle, and like you said, his stats speak for itself. Like he's been busy, he's been tough, he's carried strong, he's got he's been close to getting tries, he's got tries, like he's been dominant through the middle of the park, and they needed someone uh, with some leadership qualities to get through the middle of the park for the South Sydney Rabbitohs through those tough times, and they've looked straight to him, and he hasn't let anyone down. It's a bit like the Warriors with Mitch Barnett. Yeah. They've put him in the middle. Mm -hmm. He's still got that back row agility, but they've got back row minutes in mm -hmm. them. So they can play him in the middle, still play tough, carry the ball hard, as you said, averaging 224 metres a game in the last seven weeks, but can do it for long minutes, can yeah. stay out there. So... It doesn't affect their rotation as much. They can take George Burgess off, yep. Tom Burgess off, sorry, and um, David Moali. Those sort of players, they can just interchange with you and leave him out there for some longer minutes. Yep. He's been beast. Especially when Cam Murray hasn't been there. Yep. Exactly. Uh, moving on to Knights versus Broncos at McDonald Jones. 30-14 to the Broncos. Even though that's a big score, it still seems kind of flattering to the Knights because they were pretty atrocious in this game. Uh, Adam, your prediction was 26-18 to the Broncos. <laughs> Willie, yours was 30-20 to the Broncos. So you guys are both pretty right with those ones. Yeah, um, again, all the expectation on the Broncos. There was nothing on the Newcastle Knights. The talk was the Brisbane Broncos most of the week and then after after Origin on who was going to back up for, for the Brisbane Broncos as 
because they were in this tough position of never been in here from a grand final below the, you know, struggling to be in the eight. Um, they needed their origin players to back up. There was no way they could have them on the sidelines. And then, obviously, the addition to Adam Reynolds being in the team. And you just seen, I guess, the difference from when he's not there to when he is there around, I guess, the excitement around Reese Walsh, the way he plays, um, and, and every other player around him. Uh, Pia Kura, the way he plays, Jordan Ricky, the way he plays, Jesse Arthurs, the way he plays. And I think with his kicking game, his experience and his knowledge and his calmness and his leadership helps the Broncos be that team and Ezra Mam be that team that they want to be from obviously the last year's performances. They were they were fast is the way that they try and play anyway. They were fast, they were exciting. Um, Paddy Carrigan, dominant again for the amount of minutes and what he'd done in Origin and, and Payne Haas to be able to do what they've done and being able to back up on the back of that performance and then put in another solid performance for the Brisbane Broncos was enormous. I thought they were the best team on the park without a doubt, but the addition that Adam Reynolds added to that team gave, I think, gave the Broncos fans some excitement of this is what we've been looking for and this is what we've wanted. I know Kevin Walters will be happy with that performance. Um, as long as they can keep Adam Reynolds healthy and fit, they will keep excelling and getting better because the confidence he brings to that team is crazy. And on the, on the nights, they were poor. They were poor. They were outplayed by a team that was more committed, more committed to, to the cause. Both teams have things to play for, and at this time of the year, everyone's playing for something. I just think that they were, they were below par and against a, a team that was hungry and desperate and... Um, I didn't think they were good enough to beat the Broncos and our score predictions, obviously not that close, but we always thought that the Broncos will get over the top of the Newcastle Knights. And I guess Adam O'Brien would be disappointed because they are a better team than what they delivered. But again, just not not good enough to get a, get a win against the Broncos. There were three halfbacks that came back this weekend uh, after long periods out of the game, and I thought they all stood up. We've already spoken about Jamal Fogarty, and the question is always, to what extent are they going to have a positive influence on their team? I think they all had a big one, mm. and uh, one more so than the other two, but we'll speak about him later. But I thought Adam Reynolds' influence on the team, he just knows what plays mm. to put on when, what kicks to put on when, where to put, when to put it in the corner, when to find touch, when to put it in the air, and when to run the plays. Mm. And I thought because he's got all those threats around him, he affects the defence to the point where when Reese Walsh was playing down the other side of the field, he was having a field day. Yeah. He was having a field day because he had a foil on the other side, such as the influence that... Uh, Adam Reynolds has, and it's not just what he does with the ball. That sort of effect off the ball is huge mm. for them because that was uh, one of Reese's best games yeah, for a little definitely, while. Definitely. Running the ball again, scoring tries, opening spaces up for people. He's got a beautiful little short play mm. um, that the back rowers read. If they can start to develop some of that, they're going to start to get themselves closer to the eight because yeah. that was must win. Yeah. That was must win for them. At Newcastle, in Newcastle's backyard, and that's why I thought it was really disappointing how they feared in front of their own fans the Knights. They were poor the last time out. They were poor, I think it was St George, when they got absolutely turned over. But to come and do it in your own backyard and not perform, there's some uh, deeper issues. They relied heavily on Caelan Ponga coming back last year yeah. to get them on a run and get them into the playoffs. He played this week. They had, unfortunately, Bradburn Best go down with a yeah, hamstring heavy. injury. He'll be out for a little while. Um, they're saying it's just a twinge, but you never know how those things can go. I think there's some bigger things going on yeah. at the Knights. They've, as you said, they're still in touch with the eight. Yep. They're still in contention, of, but they just don't look like a football team that's happy at the moment or playing to their capabilities Rumours that people are being shopped about, Saifiti's signed elsewhere, whether that's affecting things. They've, they've got some real salary cap issues yeah. that they've got to manage and, you know, whether players are being told they're being kept or not. 
but still you've got a responsibility to play to the team right now yeah. and fulfil your obligations to that contract. And those guys are playing way, way under par. Yeah, I, I definitely think the disruption around salary cap and people getting named in the public and the media has some sort of effect on the performances, especially their key players in their team too. They are big names, leaders, uh, you know, Saifidis, Braley, you know, Braley's now coming off the bench, Phoenix Crossland starting. And, and I think when you think of their halves as well, I think they've tried to have different halves at different stages of the year. And I don't think it's been working. Um, again, like you said about uh, Kalen Ponga, they've relied a lot on Kalen Ponga, but if Kalen Ponga isn't playing, how do they how do they fare? Yes, they won some games without him in there, but I just like you said, I just think there's something there that's going on in the background that they just can't seem that they're not good enough at the moment to win the games and the the, the competition's on the line for them. Um, and they're in a position to play in the eight, but I just don't think they're playing well enough to get into the eight. And on the back of some of their the performances of late, it just hasn't been good enough. Um, some, yeah, and uh, you know when you think about it, you don't think it's a distraction for the team, but I think it's a distraction for the individual. And then if you're not performing well, it affects the team uh, yeah. because what you're focusing on is, is what what you can control. You should be focusing on that, which is your performance consistently. You, like you said, yeah, there's an obligation for you to turn up and perform well, but it would be hard when you've been told, or it's come out in the media that you're on the chopping block because of the salary cap problems that they have there yeah. to be able to be really committed to trying to turn up and perform, which you should be anyway, because that's your job and that's your role. Yeah. But this is your career. This is your career that people are talking about. This is your life that people are talking about. And at the same time, you want to be organizing what that life looks like if it's not at the nights, you know? So there's a lot of distractions for a lot of those individuals that have been named, which is, I think, could be subconsciously affecting their performance, but also the team's performance. Yeah, and if it's affecting you day to day, yeah. and affecting how you're working, yeah. um, and it's having an effect, therefore, on your teammates, then it is affecting others. Yeah. And this is what you got to be careful of as an individual. You know, you've got every right to have a degree of disappointment mm. if, the, if you're one of the people who's been mentioned but you can't let that affect yeah. your group. This is what you're talking about, being a professional, mm. you know, and, and being the bigger person and still delivering for the for the team. You've yeah. got to put the team first before yourself. Anyway, um, on a positive note for mine, you mentioned it already, um, I had so much admiration for all 34 players that played oh, on Wednesday night. Huge. And the way that most of those guys have doubled up this week, and you talk about Pat Carrigan, uh, Mitch Barnett oh. for the Warriors. And Kurt Kate. Well, they, they were enormous. Everyone, everyone that, that played this weekend just stepped up again. And just how they found the energy, how they found it within themselves to deliver it again. Yeah. Um, it was outstanding. And so, all those guys, um, they were on Wednesday, but even more so after this weekend, a real credit to the game. Well, it's, it's a responsibility for those players that they take personally to make sure when they do back up, they turn up and perform, which it, it shouldn't be because they just put their body through 80 minutes of the toughest, I think, third game I've seen in a long time, especially their first half, to, to turn up and perform that the way that they did all over the weekend, obviously starting off with Mitch Barnett playing, I think he might have played 80 minutes. Him, him and Kurt Catewell out wide, he had to go out wide and shift because of all the team. So for everyone that backed up and they did not let anyone down. And I know coaches talk about um, the others lifting to their standard, but I think they blow everyone out of the park yeah. because I guess, again, it's a responsibility for them to do that because they are origin players. But for us as fans, you don't expect them to go over and beyond because you understand that they've just come off an, a massive performance in origin, but you can be a seven. You can be a seven, but a lot of those boys were nines, eight and nines, and made enormous on the back of what they'd done over that that origin that origin series in that third game to be able to play that the way they did in 48 hours, you know, a little bit longer for some. I reckon the longer the the game is on the weekend, the first, like if you play on a Sunday and you played played on the Wednesday night, I reckon the sore you are. You, you couldn't tell when they were playing. No. You know, Reese Walsh, 
You know, the way he ran, you would have thought he'd do a hammy the way that he'd run in the, the speed that he's running out. Obviously, with, with Bess doing a hammy, chasing him down, like, I would expect that, that if you're getting to those high speeds after Wednesday's game, like, geez, you're close to doing something like a hammy like that, and I think... That's what, I think that's why it was. It's like it's a hard, it's a hard one because you they want to back up, and they want to perform, but at the same time, like you're, you know, high speeds away from doing something, if you haven't rested enough. And they talk about workload. You talk about workload. You know what I mean? And we talk about how long this competition is. We talk about how tough this competition is, but then the expectation that people watch the game to see your best players on the field, but then. They come back, they perform, there's a hammy, there's a shoulder, yeah. or there's something else, and then they're going, well, oh, the season's too long. So you can't win in the game of rugby league. There is no winners. The fans get what they're given because of what the players do, and enormous effort from all of those guys, bro. Like, like you said, man, those Origin players were beasts all over the weekend. Huge. Hey, I just want to call out the you know, our recent, recent Instagram reel that's been blowing up in the comments section. Wow. Comments Everyone is Everyone disrespecting is. you guys for not playing Origin, but look at you guys giving your props to the players, man. Those people, hey, that, those, that, you better watch out. That, um, that um, real, was it a real or was it just a story, man? That was popping off to all those <laughs> mean as blues fans that I've never seen, never seen or never heard from through the series yeah. until this win. <laughs> Hide in my brothers, <laughs> hide in my brothers. It's great to see you all yeah. coming. I love it. Oh. This is why we do what we do. This is why we do what we do is for the people to have their thoughts and their opinions on everything we do. How good. I love it. <laughs> we'll move on to the Storm versus the Roosters at Amy Park. 24 to 8 to the Storm. Your guys' predictions, Adam? 16 12 to the Storm. Willie, 26-24 to the Roosters, which I backed you up on. I was believing in the Roosters too, but... It's too, but <laughs> yes, you did too. But uh, the Storm, just too good at home. The finals run is starting, and the Storm, as usual, are leading the charge. Bro, they, um, they just get it done. They just get it done, and they have been getting it done all season. No matter who's in or who's out, um, someone steps up. Someone steps up. And, man, they were enormous through that game. It was a massive game, 1v3. We pump it up as fans. Um, you know, the players would see that as another game because we're not even at finals yet. So it's, it's another game that they want to put in their best performance so that they can prepare themselves for the back end of the competition. And... Uh, I think Craig Bellamy was more excited around the, the defensive display of what the Storm did because I don't think they have been at their best defensively. And a club that relies heavy on defence, um, they would be they were happy with what they delivered. To be able to only allow the Roosters, who I think is a great attacking team with the players that they have in the in the great athletes they have through their team, enormous effort from those guys. Um, you know, there were some outstanding performances out there. Grant, was it Grant Anderson? Grant Anderson, Grant yeah. Anderson, he was like, he's a player that you don't really see too much of, but on that on that game, he was an animal. Like, I didn't even knew he was that quick. He was hitting some holes, and he was yeah. flying down there and scoring some great tries. I thought he was a, a great performer on the night. Um, he, he really challenged them. They were committed to everything they did, and they just out played out muscle to the Roosters. I think the Roosters, um, they tried hard. They tried hard, but again, the Storm defensively were just too strong, and that's what they rely themselves on these days, and they've always done that. They've tried to be the, the best defensive team in the comp, and um, they held them to less, what was it, eight points? Eight points in the end, so another quality effort from the Storm. You see, that's why they sit at the top of the ladder, because... They are consistent with their performance. Yes, they haven't played a, a full 80 minutes to their standard, but managing to get wins through the season without half their players. And they've still got Cameron Munster sitting on the sideline. And I think Wishart's been enormous for them. Uh, people that have come in and replaced players um, have been awesome. I think they've got a, a great side of mix between young and old, talent and new so far long only gets a few minutes on the field and manages to score tries. <laughs> like he's got to try on him every game if he gets on the field, just gotta get him on earlier. But 
he's doing some great things there. I guess it, it, it's a lot of trust and re, rely, reliance on some of these guys that are just coming in and getting the job done. And that's what Melbourne's built their their their, their club around is giving guys opportunities to understand their jo jobs and just go out there and get it done. Yeah, it was probably uh, tough in every sense of the word um, and a true reflection of the Melbourne Storm and Craig Bellamy um, and his coaching as an organisation. They they lost Christian Welsh and Nelson Asufa Solomona, uh, won the day before and won the morning of the game. I uh, thought Max King really stepped up in the middle for them and uh, took ownership of that middle of the park for Jerome Hughes to run run right oh, again. He just enormous. has a field day. And this is why people like Grant Anderson can enjoy the space and the moments that they get. Um, a little bit of concern for Grant Anderson right at the end of the mm, game. I've got this look, knee. Oh, oh, look yeah. horrible. And I, I hope it was more uncomfortable. I've, I've tried to have a look and see if there was anything out there on a report, but I hope the young fella's all right. But... No doubt the way they have been Melbourne, they'll find someone else to step up and play centre and and just take the mantle. It sort of goes hand in hand too with some of the stuff we've been saying about the Roosters attacking-wise, outstanding. Mm. But defensively, that's where their frailties are. And if you're able to defend and be tough against them, you'll go close to beating them, which is what Melbourne did. In round one, Melbourne, I think they won 8 0 against Penrith. Yeah. They just defended really well. They lost a little bit of that, which happens over the course mm. of the season. You can see they're fine tuning and finding some of that as their run to the playoffs starts to begin. They're finding that steely attitude to just keep covering. It's not perfect, mm. and seldom is it perfect. Someone misses, someone else covers. Yeah. Their line speed's in their face. They forced errors out of the Roosters because they know how dangerous their attack is, and it frustrated them. Yeah. It really pickled them. So, yeah, uh, they showed a sign for other teams who are going to play the Roosters how you can, you know, unlock the key against them. But Melbourne, they just keep going about their business. Yep. And I talk about Grant Anderson. The next bloke will come in. He'll know what his job is and he'll perform it to the best of his ability. Dangerous, danger for everyone else is Cam Munster's is only around the corner. Mm. He's not far away. Well, they got, you know, for me, Jack Howarth, who couldn't make the starting team or couldn't even make the team at all, has now found themselves in the centre and has looked at home in the centre. Big raps mm. on this kid uh, for a long time. I put him in the, the Māori side because I think he's a talent. I thought he was a talent. We had him in the Kiwi A's and I really think he's a great talent. A deep thinker of the game, so sometimes for young guys, overthinking a lot. But I feel like he's gone to another level in the centres. I think what it's done, it's given them confidence. The coach has given them confidence that, hey, we believe in what you can do. Go out there and show me. And I reckon he's been really solid out in the centres. He's fast, he's strong, he's athletic. I think he's he's got great feet. He defends well. Um, there's something about him in the centres I, I actually enjoy. I, um, I, I talk to a lot of these guys just because in and around the Māori space as well. And Man, I messaged him and said, man, the last couple of weeks have been enormous in the centres. Like, you're coming up, up against quality in centres. Like, centres are a tough position to defend, and, and I think he's doing a really good job out there. So, like, guys like him and enjoying the space of what uh, Jerome Hughes creates, again, mate, if he doesn't go close to winning that Dell M, this, this thing is, I think he's one of the best halves consistently this year through the... the, the um, the competition with the amount of players he's had to deal with ins and outs, but still being able to do what he's done for the Storm. He's been the key to the Storm in their performances. Um, they, I think, yeah, like you said about the, the Roosters uh, and the, the Storm, I think you bully the bullies. And, and that's how, I think that's how the Roosters play. Obviously, Jarrett's not there, but when he's there, he's a bully. Yeah. you got these big boys through the middle of the park. you got Victor Radley out wide. you got... Uh, Crichton that wide as well, who just want to get in your face and, and make it uncomfortable for you. Like you said, the blueprint, you have to take it to them. You can't sit back and allow them to play. Brandon Smith comes in there and he tries to fly out the line and tries to make a yeah. statement. So that's that's what the, the Roosters and how they play is. They've got guys that can come out of the line and put shots on, which Brandon Smith did. Yep. But what the Storm do consistently is just keep turning up, just keep turning up and just keep rolling down the field and just give it to Jerome Hughes. He puts him in the corner and they just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So 
there is a blueprint there. You've got to be able to bully the bullies and you have to come at them head first. You can't allow the Roosters to play footy because we know they can score points and they've got a good enough talent to run around you or run through you. With When Brandon Smith gets an opportunity to run, he runs through the middle of that park and he was trying to do it the other night, but the Storm obviously know what he does and know what he do, what he can do, and they put numbers around him and suffocate. Every time he tried to run, there was someone on yeah. him all the time. And hey, we've got I've got to mention the Max King kick, the no try, the no try. Oh. Hey, honestly, that kick was finesse. Like yeah. <laughs> there was a curve on that yeah. thing right to the winger, and I was like, oh, bro, that is an awesome kick. Like he actually, I reckon he he looked up, he saw the winger, he purposely put that grubber in so that it could go that way straight to the winger. What a great kick that was for a front run. Un unlucky no try, but wow. Some halves could learn a thing or two. 100%. 100%. That was awesome. That was awesome. You talk about uh, the centres getting some joy and Sean Bloor is another one. Yeah. Been outstanding. Wasn't in the side no. at the start of the season. No. Gets an opportunity through Joe Chan and a couple of others getting injured. Yeah. He's just made that jersey his own. He's been, he's been enormous run, running great lines. Um, he was playing Bears. Yep. He was playing Bears. At the, like, I think the New South Wales Cup Warriors team played against him. You know what I mean? Like, so I've seen him playing down at Bears as well. And and like like everyone, there's an opportunity when someone goes down. And he's come in there and he's been enormous. Like being strong, hard to handle, uh, been involved in everything, runs really good lines. He's a go-to when they play short because he runs a really strong line and he's hard to handle close to the line. And everyone's reaping the benefits of what everyone's, like Jerome Hughes in the middle forwards have been able to do for sure. How important is that, Blairy, that you have a coach that, one, is going to give young fellas an opportunity, but when he does give you an opportunity and you perform, he's going to keep yeah. you in there? Because well, th some coaches will get a young fella in and even though they're playing well, they'll still put the senior player back in. Well, I think that's the great thing about the Melbourne Storm and their culture and what they what they do is everyone understands the role that they got to play. So no matter who gets injured, I guess un unless you're um, you know Cameron Munster or, Cameron Jerome, Munster Hughes, or yeah. Jerome Hughes, you know through the middle of the pack, if you uh, if you get that opportunity and you make the most of it, like Sean Bloor's doing. Why would you why would you move someone that's been so dominant on that left edge for them and running really good lines and scoring tries and being good defensively? Why would you move someone out of there? Um, they've always, I guess, they've always been able to. Or they've lost players in those back rows over the years, and they've been always able to find someone that can fill in. So Chan started the season; he was solid, he was good, he was doing a good job for them. He got reward. He's keep playing. He starts. He gets injured. Someone else comes in. Just go out there and get your job done. Um, he puts a lot of trust in the systems that the Storm have that these guys can come in and get their job done. And, and I think when you get your job done consistently week in, week out, he never moves you. He never moves you. Similar to Jack Howarth. Is he a centre? I don't know. I'm sure he was meant to be their back rower or a middle player. Now he's playing in the centre. Been really good. He ain't getting moved. No. Like, why would you? Why would you move someone that's doing really well and you've put trust in him, you've given him belief, you take that away from him, he could go the other way. But no, hold on a minute, we'll leave him out there because he's playing so well. Yep. I guess that's the respect that you have for someone that's been in the game long enough that understands the system and structure of the Melbourne Storm, trust that these kids are going to get a job done for you and trust that they're going to be out there and get it done. When they're going well, why don't you leave them there? So that's what he does. I think it's... It's a great, it's great that the Storm do this. It's great that Craig Bellamy trusts in his systems, which he always has, and these guys come in and get an opportunity and they just carve up. Wishart, for example, doesn't let anyone down, has done a good job and falls in everywhere on that team, um, from fullback to the halves yeah. and could play hooker as well. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a club that really relies on their systems and structures and their culture to go out there and get a job done, and they do it consistently. And it works because it's working in reserve grade. Yeah. And because it works in reserve grade, and those young fellas, they know that if they keep performing, their chance may come. Yeah. You know, some reserve grades, I'm not going to get a chance. And, yeah. And yeah. they fall away. But if you see someone you've played with at the start of the year going great guns yeah. and being rewarded, hey, that could happen to me. Yeah. I could get my chance. Yeah. I might be one injury away. So I've got to keep playing well. Well, you've got to be patient, and that's the game eh, we play, is that you have to be patient because your chance is just around the corner. If you're not patient with it and you want to move and get out of there, 
you're you're most probably an opportunity away from playing. So the grind is real. The grind is real in the game of NRL and through the pathways. But the patient, you have to be real patient with everything that you do. And then when that opportunity comes, you have to strike. You have to be the best player you can be. And then that's when the, you only work harder to keep that position. So. You, you work hard in the game, you don't let anyone down, and you hold your position. I think the long of the days where, I think when I came through in 06, a long time ago, um, like I played 16 games my first year, and then I was back and forwards from uh, Queensland Cup and, and learning my craft, and that's what they used to do back those days, is they'll give you three games, go back. There's always things to work on. You're never the yep. complete player when you first start off. Go back, do this, come back in. That's how they did it. But now these days, I think if you're good enough and you're playing consistent football, you stay in their position, no matter where you're 18, 19, or 20. So a great thing about what everyone's doing these days, if you go out there and perform really well as a young kid, you hold your position. You, you, you dominate, you keep it. So, yeah. I think the Melbourne Storm are just a true testament to the culture and the systems and the structure that they've always had forever. That anyone that goes down there, Ali Katoa, for example, is, is is dominant, and they've just they just continue to do it consistently. And on those three guys on the Storm left edge that have been the fill-ins, uh, their stats for the game are pretty incredible. They combined together for three tries, six line breaks, five hundred and fifty meters and missed only three tackles. <laughs> like, they were, the three of them together were crazy. That's Anderson, Howarth, and uh, Bloor. Uh, we'll move on to the Panthers versus the Dolphins at Blue Bet, 28 to 26 to the Panthers. And the Iceman has returned, big man Nathan Cleary. You guys were both right with your predictions. 24-16 <laughs> to the Panthers. 26-16 to the Panthers for you, Adam, first. And oh, I read that wrong, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you guys both got it right. Uh, but yeah, Nathan Cleary, man, how good is it to have him back? Yeah, yeah, it's great to have him back. Hey, and um, make sure next time we record, you fellas have mean as internet. Because um, <laughs> the whole time you were talking there, you're cutting up. Yeah. But it, but that's all good. That's all good, bro. The show goes on. Tell those fellas in the background to get off the Wi-Fi so that we can actually do a show properly. Um, but that's cool. We we roll on. We don't, you know. Last time I was on Bali, we're getting the show done. Willie was on Whangarei. So hey, the show goes on. But yeah, coming back to the, anyways, coming back to the NRL and that Dolphins and Panthers game. Yes, um, again. As well as the hype of Adam Reynolds, the hype of having Nathan Cleary back for the Penrith Panthers was enormous. And yes, again, it proves it, he proves everyone right and, and comes home and wins their game. What a game this was. Um, man, I thought, I thought the Dolphins were going to get this. And they should have. They should have. Young Isaiah Katoa, 2 minutes 35. To go. To go. A pass comes off the sideline. He's literally in front. And I know he shook his head after this because I don't I don't know if he was watching the time or no, knew what was going on because I think, like, I don't know if Penrith thought that they were, he was going to have a shot either, but I, I think that there was an opportunity right there, 2 minutes 35 to go in the game, to take the one point and win the game. I thought they were good enough to yep. win that game. Um, they looked like a good, a bit, the better team until the last 20 minutes of the, the second half where some of those tries that Penrith scored were, were quite soft, to be honest. Um, they were really good. I thought Cody at the back of some of those plays with his sleight of hand and how far that Isaiah and him engaged the line – Questioned, questioned a lot of the defence in the centres for the, uh, the the Penrith Panthers and most of the time they scored points off it. So I thought they did really well to get them into the position. I thought, you know, Jesse Bromans was solid through the middle of the park getting them down there. But that last 20 minutes from, from Penrith, to get those tries, to bring them back into the game, to then end up obviously winning the game, man, like like Willie you were doing, he was had ice in his veins because he misses that kick from 43 out. It's a seven tackle set. They could go down there and get in the position to kick a goal, but never the mind. Uh, Nathan Nathan Cleary ices it and wins the game. But there was moments in there that if Redcliffe go back over their footage, which they will, and see that there was plenty of opportunities to take that game away from them. And um, Zayka Toa, yeah, shaking his head and thinking, "Damn, I should have kicked that one point right in front of the goal." And I thought that would have been the game for for the Dolphins, um, but. 
Great to see Nathan Cleary back out there. Um, obviously a big difference to what they were doing. You chuck Jerome Luwai after he comes back from his break. Man, they're going to be a hard team to beat on the back of, obviously, Moses Lota, um and Fisher-Harris, the way that they carry and some of the younger boys out wide. Um, yeah, I thought they were, they were strong uh, at times, but I thought, you know, the Dolphins should have won that game and lost their game themselves. So I don't think Penrith beat them in the sense of the game. I think there was a moment there that the Redcliffe Dolphins would want to have back and, and take that one point to take it away. Two minutes 35, I thought they would have been good enough to hold on. Yeah, they, they should have kicked on, especially how dominant they were in the first half. Yeah. And you're talking about the halves playing at the line and it opened up yeah. space for Herbie Farmworth yeah. and Hammer yeah. to score a couple and, and get a lot of joy down that left-hand side of the field. Um, they were just running havoc to the point where 20 minutes to go, it's 26-12. Yeah. They're cruising. They're yeah. cruising. And Penrith, as they do, fight back and get it back to 26 all. And and then, the, you know, he steps up to the four. But that two minutes to go, they made a break. They were deep yeah. in their half and they yeah. made a break down the right-hand side. Yeah, got Jermaine. a bit of field position on, on four. Five, they shifted again. And then they tackled close right to 10 metres. Like, this is it. Yeah. They're building up to it here. Yeah. But... Yeah, Katoa, just some inexperience. And it was a poor kick too. It was, it was a poor, poor crossfield kick, kick. Yeah. yeah. It was like it was 10 minutes into the game and we were just going to complete the yeah. set into the corner. He didn't put it up there for Isaiah Kat um, Jermaine. for Jermaine Asako to get up yeah. and try and challenge. It was just, I'm going to get rid of the kick. When it, I think everybody, and you're saying he shook his head. Yeah. And everybody else was like, why didn't you just have a crack? Yeah. Right there and then. But it opened the door. For the man of the hour to step up, and as I said, the three halfbacks came back this weekend, and he probably had the biggest influence because mm. of this moment. And it wasn't just the field goal; it was a two-pointer to win the game, 28-26. Just calm as you like, hit it, and you watch it. And usually there's a curve to it, but it was just straight as yeah. the sp the spin on the rotation on the ball just never deviated. You can just see the fans behind the yeah. sticks just jumping. It's one of those. It's it's almost like a fairy tale, and this he just keeps re rewriting his story. Oh. Nathan Cleary and I didn't what he did he in the grand leave. final last year or something else, and yeah. what he's done on the representative level. But he just keeps adding little chapters to his story. Yeah. Well, there was a conversation mid game. You know, twenty minutes to go, and they were out of the game. Like we said, they should have. The Dolphins should have kicked on. The commentators, hey, we've seen Nathan Cleary be in a similar situation in a grand final and come back and win the game, and surely enough. Uh, a couple of soft tries, even that Moses Leota try. You know, I think he steps Kenny Bromwich. Good he was, step, though. He was, he was standing still five metres out. Five metres out, standing still. Go whack on Kenny Bromwich. Would have been filthy. Oh. And then scores a try. Obviously brings him back in the game. And then if you give Plymouth Panthers a sniff and you score one try, you know they're going to get another one. Nathan Cleary starts playing what he does, and then obviously that big kick. I just didn't think he'd have the legs to kick that 43. It was a big kick, and I'm thinking, oh, no, nah, no legs here, have no legs. He smacked that ball straight through the middle of the post, and, mate, that's why I guess he's on the big bucks up there, and that's why he's the player he is, because he ices every single moment that he's had, and nine times out of ten, he gets them every time, and... Uh, enormous game to come back into. A great That was a great game to watch, to be honest. Um, but yeah, Dolphins will be thinking that that one got away with them. There was a moment of controversy. We've spoken a little bit about some of this throughout the season. Uh, Mitch Kenny goes for a charge down on Katoa. Yes. And just as it keeps getting away, I thought he was committed to the tackle. He wouldn't have hurt him with a feather with that and how much he touched him, but... I think there's just so protected uh, kickers. Yeah. And there's some, yeah, you got to, you can't be going full on, but sometimes you've got to recognise that the pressurer, yeah. the person going to put the pressure on, it's going that fast, he can't pull out. Yeah, oh, I think, you know, the key now for, for halves is when you kick a ball, leave the ground. Yeah. So jump. As you're kicking, like a lot of them do leave the ground. Anyway, Jerome Hughes yeah. does it. But they, they vary their kicking style depending on how close the pressure is, you know what I mean? Because you can't be touched. If you're in yep. the air, if you're in the air and you're kicking the ball and you get touched, that's a penalty. But I think on the back of the previous two weeks ago with um, Tamari Martin, like 
obviously everyone's been questioned around that of his pressure that he was put on. It should have been a penalty. But now anyone's getting touched as a as a half, like they're giving those penalties every day of the week. And like you said, like you are committed. You are committed. So I think, you know, this is what I was thinking. I've seen a few people doing it now. It's like they're tackling, but grabbing them and then holding them yeah. as they're falling down. Yeah. And then not trying to, like, catch them in the air rather than drop them and hit them on the ground. So I think maybe that's the new maybe. way of doing it because, like, you can catch them as they're cuddle. kicking, like cuddle them and don't hit them over. So I've seen a couple of people grab them and hold them up rather than tackle them and hit them and yeah. flying back. But it's a, it's a funny one, this one. I think, you know, it's really hard to get it right. Really hard to get it yeah, right. And I'm still getting my head around it. And some weeks it's not a penalty and some weeks it is or some weeks it was perfectly timed. He's in the grand, in the air. Like, yeah, I don't know with this one, but you can't, obviously you can't touch the halves these days. No. But what a game. For uh, Ivan Cleary, it was his 250th win as a NRL coach out of 432 games. So that's a 56% percentage. It's pretty good, eh? Uh, pretty yeah, it's 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 great. I think there's a I man. They've been so dominant over those four hundred plus games that, like, that fifty six percent. Every game he turns up, it's 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 they can win. They can win pretty much every game. So I think, um, like, a credit to obviously their pathways and what's been coming from. We spoke about it earlier in the show <laughs> about obviously putting money back into their grassroots, going out to the country where a lot of their players come from, bringing them through the development systems, coaching them the right way through down there, but then also coming into grade. Jerome Lua, a lot of those young guys come through there. You know, Nathan Cleary all come through their development pathways and now creating what they have, but know what it takes to win games and building a really good culture. So... Um, to be at it, you know, in the game of rugby league, that's a great percentage to have because um, she's a tough game. Yeah, and he was pretty successful right from the start of his coaching career. We started at the Warriors and took him to a grand final. and He had a stint at Penrith before going to the Tigers for a little bit, only a year or so, and then he got poached to go back and take over uh, from, uh, from Griffin at the Panthers. And then obviously they've gone on to have the success that they've had. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that, that his percentage is that high because um, he's had this really golden period with the Panthers the last couple of years. I just wonder sometimes if the Tigers ever kick themselves that they did allow him to go, that they they allowed Penrith to take him off their hands. I don't think they had much say about yeah, it. Yeah. Gus was pretty insistent at the time yeah. that uh, Ivan Cleary was going to be their man, but they had... Him in their palm of their hands. They had him there running yeah. their club and they could have kept him had things been different. Oh, the same thing with the, the Warriors fans when they had him in uh, the Warriors, you know what I mean? The fans would say, why did we let him go? But I think this is this is normal in the game of rugby league, you know, like other opportunities come up where it suits you as a, as a coach or as a player and, and the one that you're at right now isn't what you want or didn't think it was going to be where it is. Um, you get more money, which is... What everyone normally leaves for now is you're getting paid a million dollars or something to go over to Penrith Panthers, which would be all worth it right now with what and he's the rest, been, yeah. with, his, with what he's done. Yeah, that's supposed to be undercutting him. Um, so yeah, everyone would be whoever loses a really good coach and they go on to success would be oh, you know the what ifs. But in the game of rugby league, there's no what ifs. You just <sighs> got to, you got to live in the moment and, yep. and make the most of whatever you have with whoever you have, you know what I mean? So, yeah, everyone would be bloody kicking their, kicking themselves, but at, the, at now, Penrith Panthers are cheering because he's been able to build this this dynasty of, you know, success. Yeah. Next game up, Sea Eagles versus Titans at Four Pines. 38-8 uh, to the Sea Eagles. So, obviously, both you guys believed it was going to be an absolute tri-fest open game, swinging massive haymakers at each other but it was only one team that was swinging haymakers and that was the sea eagles um <laughs> adam you also said there would be two or three wingers to get hat tricks <laughs> so not quite that either uh but congrats the sea eagles for starting their run home to the finals very well yeah, well, I think I thought that was going to be the high-scoring game of the round because both teams are both attacking sides, got speed outside, out 
out wide to burn. Um, but I guess the Tigers and the Rabbitohs, the Tigers and the Rabbitohs were the highest scores over the weekend. So, um, yeah, we got that one wrong. Um, but but what a, it was, a, you know, the, the, the Seagulls are a, a great team uh, with some quality players. And the Travojevic brothers uh, are playing some outstanding. Tom at the back has added, and, and we said, obviously, with his injury and getting a little bit older, moving him into the centres, yes, he went there. But he's found himself back at fullback, and I think he's been pretty dominant at the back of there. Um, his, I guess, his his effect with how he carries the ball, which obviously holds the defence to commit to what he can do, but also the way he can, I guess, set up other players. His leadership uh, with Cherry Evans to be able to do what they do, and then. Ben doing what he does out wide. I thought he was enormous out wide for, for the Seagulls and, and challenged the Titans every time he carried the ball. So I think the Travojevic brothers were the key for me uh, in this game and they looked like they were having fun. And I think any team that goes out there and enjoys themselves and plays some football, uh, like which what both teams do, they look like they're enjoying themselves. Luke's, Luke Brooks, I think, was one of his better games. Um, he's been able to do what he does because of the way that I think the Travoy, uh, uh, Turbo's come back into the team and has allowed him to have that space on the opposite side. So when Cherry Evans and Travojevic are on one side, it opens up opportunities for Luke Brooks to do what he does. He's got a nice step on him. He's, he's a tough carrier of the ball for a little fella. Got a great pass on him as well. But I just thought they were more dominant through the game. Um, was it eight points that Titans scored? Yep. Eight points. You would have thought that they would have scored more points in the game with what they have. But I just think that they were just new. Um, the Seagulls were more dominant than than the Titans. And I think the Titans, like they have these games where there's some high high scoring games and then there's some no, some low scoring games. And this has been their season as well. And I say, I think, you know, Seagulls are inconsistent with their performance as well. But when they fire, they fire. And um, they'll be happy with this win. Again, they're sitting close into the eight. Um, the Titans are still fighting. Um, you know, they tried hard, but just not good enough in the end. Yeah, it's funny <laughs> watching games after we've made predictions yeah. and you're trying to um, cheer <laughs> for sides and cheer for the game towards the predictions we've made. And I thought we were on course there to start with, especially yeah. when uh, the Titans went up early and our man, Alufi Carpereira, scores early and we're trying to... I'm yelling at the TV to keep passing yeah, it to the left-hand side him. so he scores some more tries. <laughs> And they weren't listening, but I, I didn't think either team defended well to yeah. start with, which is what we predicted. I thought both teams were making easy metres, making half breaks through the middle of the field, a bit sloppy getting. The ability for each team to get down the opposition's half was a lot easier than what it should have been, um, which is how I thought it would be. They just couldn't convert. It took Manly a little while to get going, and then once they did get going, mm. uh, almost unstoppable. I'd, I did like Brooks running the ball, and I thought it was important that he did run the ball because it wasn't uh, a day I thought that Cherry Evans wanted to run the mm. ball. He was really kick happy, especially towards the end, and pass happy. Just wanted to get the ball out of his hands. So it was important that Brooks was the one to step up as the lead half. But yeah, the Trubojevic brothers were outstanding once again. Um, Got a bit scary there for young Lehi Hopuari with yeah. his eyes. Oh. It was almost a, a rocky moment. I hope he's uh, he's not too bad, but that caused a, a shift out to the edge. And Manly, they got the job done. They ended up getting the 38 points that I thought they would. But, yeah, Gold Coast have some work to do. They've got some work-ons. Mm. Um, I didn't like how they played when they were close to the goal line um, too often trying to hit the lead runner. And there was a moment there when I think Fafita went from dummy half and then... The yeah. next one went from dummy half, just trying to take the easy way rather than get in the hands of their threats. Because mm. when Keanu Kenny got the ball, he got it in very little space this week. He wasn't able to run and expose any holes in the opposition. So they do have that ability. They can do it. And they've got to know they can do it. They've just got to keep doing it consistently. Yeah, well, so what happens when they, when they take those scooters, they go away from the positions that they need to get to or the people that take the scoots, get out of position, i.e. for feeder, which when they want to go and attack to those sides, you're not in the position to attack. So if, you, for example, you're talking about Keanu Kinney, 
if they're not at the certain point of the field for him to have that space, then it's a waste of time running that shape towards him because, like you said, he just gets they get outnumbered and they, they, they suffocate him because he has no space. Keanu Kinney's best when there's space around him and when he can play football. He's got the threat of running with his speed and footwork or he's got the threat to pass. So, like you said, I think there was opportunities there, but they kept playing short, keep playing coming dummy half runs, which was taking away the key threats for Fida, for example, of being able to go bo attack both sides. He is a threat when he gets the ball wider. Yes, I've seen him score tries from close to the line as well, but I think Manly and a lot of people are doing their homework on someone like Fafida. Anytime he's at dummy half close to the line, he's going to pick the ball up and try and score a try. So and it just suffocates the, the threats that they need to have. Uh, Karen Foran when he gets the ball and he's engaging the line is when he's at his best and which opens up the opportunities for the outside backs. But the more times they play short, the more times they go, they run from dummy half, the less opportunities the, the, the threats have Campbell and Foran to be able to play their football. So I think if they can get the balance right and we know what they can do attack-wise, they get the balance right and they play to a point that they need to play to so that they have their back rows as their threats and then the outside backs on the back of that with the way that they run, Campbell and Karen Foran, then they're a better threat or better opportunities of scoring points, especially when you get close to the line. They're a hard team to stop with the amount of players and the speed that they have. A um, couple of those that try that Aloffy scores, they try to do that the second time around and they read it. So people are seeing these plays now and people are understanding it. Obviously, there's a lot of footage out there now through the NRL and they watch everyone's game closely. So they've seen that, yes, it didn't it work the first time, the second time it didn't work because they read that. And the smart players are able to adjust on the run like the yeah. Manly Seagulls, Seagulls did. So it may work the first time and you get lucky, but the second time around it may not because they've they've been able to adjust and identify that on the run, which is what the good players do. So yeah. Um, get them in the right positions, they can score some points, the Gold Coast Titans. Yeah, they showed that. Yeah, we go back to the Warriors game, they showed mm. that more than they've got the ability to score. They've got threats on the on the edges, especially when they've got Sami and yeah. and Alofi Carpereira. They've got Keanu Kinney out the back. So they've got some potency on the edges and speed. Just got to try and find them in the right spaces mm. at the right times, as you're saying, from the right points. Mm. On to the final game of the week, uh, the Cowboys versus the Bulldogs at Queensland Country Bank. 20 to 18 to the Cowboys. Adam, you predicted 22 to 12 to the Cowboys and Willie, 20 to 14 to the Bulldogs. And again, I said I would join you, Willie, with the Bulldogs. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> Bro, straight up, man. Give me some. Give me something. <laughs> give me something. Hey, to be fair, to be fair, Ethram, if if the dogs had scored that try next yep. to the post clade on, then we're sitting pretty. Yeah. And just right. and that could have gone either way. It was just a little bit of slippage. I thought he had some downward pressure, <laughs> but the referee said no try. So. The video ref had no uh, no choice but to go with that referee, especially because it was some indecision from him. But yeah, the Cowboys uh, strong at home. Tom Alolo mm. starting to find some form again. Oh, yo, you know, he's off been the back really fence. off the back fence. All right, looking How strong, good? looking fit, looking energetic, looking busy. Mm. As, as Scott Drinkwater, he's really dangerous for them. They're missing some. They're missing some outside backs, but yeah, a couple of them really stood up for. Uh, for the Cowboys this week, and Tom Payton will be really, really happy. But the Dogs, you know, probably a little bit too reliant on kicks rather than playing footy. And when they did, they they come up with that bomb try. But their yeah, Dogs are looking to be taken seriously. Yeah. And they've got to keep evolving their attack because defensively they yeah. are strong. Defensively they've got a real strong mindset, which champion teams have. They've just got to fix up their attack. And uh, become a threat in that department. I think that I, I think that they could be sitting top of the table defensive team in the comp. Like they're not leaking too many points every game. I think I think they're averaging like sixteen, which is normally pretty solid if you can score more points than them. Yep. So that's this is where the dogs are having their issues. Is I heard Cameron Serrato speak. They had a couple of weeks off. They were they were. 
the defense is there. The, the mindset and the defensive resolve is there. They're working hard for each other. They've got real good line speed. They're coming off the try line real fast. Joshi Curran is, is working really hard through the middle of the park. He's doing some, some amazing things for that team. Vilami Kikau has been solid. Some of their, their no-name middle forwards are working really hard a, as a group there. They're scrambling really well. They get into the corners. They're doing everything that a championship team, defensive championship team, would do this time of the year. So they're getting all of that right. Uh, it's the the attacking uh, attack for me. I don't haven't seen them besides that no try that they score break too many, or even if they've broken the line, they haven't been able to execute and finish off the try. So a lot of their tries are coming off kicks. And again, when you get to the back end of the competition and you get to the finals football, I don't know if those kicks are going to be good enough for them. But defensively, if you can hold a team to 12 or 16 points or less, you give yourself a chance. And sometimes those kicks are 50-50 and and you get those points and you score those points and that's what they've been able to do. Again, what a game. I think this whole weekend, this whole round of football was exciting um, because we're getting closer to the end. We're getting closer to the eight. Every game's a tight game. Every game's a must win for most teams. And we're seeing the best come out of individuals. Jason Tomalolo, for example, man. And when I see him run off the back fence, I'm like, bro, this is this is him. Like this is when he's at his best. When he's when he's beating defenders, when he's running hard, when he's looking fit, when he's challenging the line every time he carries the ball. Like he's a big part of the Cowboys and has been for a long time. We've missed a little bit of that through some injuries and some sort of and patches, but now I feel like he's coming right at the right end of the season. And on the back of what he does, on the back of some of these young guys that's filling in out wide, drink water, dead, and um, those guys have been, Chad Townsend staring them around the park, I think those guys have been dominant for, Nanai's coming out there, they've been dominant for the Cowboys. Again, they're an attacking side they're attacking side, and hence why I said that we'll have that many points scored. Um, but they were they were they were strong all the way to the end. And this game could have gone either way for for the Bulldogs or the Cowboys. But the Cowboys managed to get home and and win this one, which at home they needed to. In the context of the competition, they needed to win as well to keep them in the eight or keep them fighting for to, to hold those positions. Um, some quality league played. Uh, and obviously did, and to score that try to take the game away and still have time time left for Bulldogs to win it. But I couldn't see the Bulldogs breaking the line to score a try. It was always going to come from a kick for me, and um, the Cowboys done a good enough job to, to beat the Bulldogs. Uh, again, a lot of teams would be disappointed in these close losses that they could have won it, and they should have won it, or they had moments or opportunities to win the game, but never got it done. This is how good the competition is. It's so tight now that, you know, there's, it comes down to moments and moments that you need to execute and you need to score points. And uh, they'll be disappointed, the, the Bulldogs, but Cowboys will be excited because that's another win for them and keeps them in touch or in the eight and, and fighting to be and to hold your position. So another great game of rugby league. Well, what a, what a weekend we'll sport to. Yeah, I think some of it's uh, a little bit what you were talking about before, how teams review and preview and go over the footage and then edges sit together and watch the opposition. When Dogs the start of the year, that left-hand side was threatening every yep. single time with Burton, Kikau, yeah. um, Cherry, and then they had Addo Carr yep. out there as well. Teams started to read it and they started to play on the right-hand side, started to get some joy with Preston and, and Crichton, yep. um, start to read that. So now I just feel like they're trying to adjust on the run a little bit and play a little bit more eyes up footy mm. and get Burton on the right hand side yep. a little bit more and I like the fact that they're doing that that they're, they're changing on the run and trying to keep ahead of the curve so to speak but they're not quite working at the moment there's some mm. uh, they've got to get together especially Burton and Sexton they've got to get that partnership going a little bit better and Marty's got to pick moments when to play he's not another one probably hits the leads a lot on yeah. in good ball on the goal line when you know sees the space late and play out the back, expose some of that. But yeah, a little bit of safety within them at the moment. Cowboys, as you're saying, at home, good to get back on track. Um, a question for you and a thought I had watching the game yesterday. Cowboys go short. Uh, drink water just falls on it. Yes, over the plane he yep. knocks it on. Yep, it doesn't knock it on. He gets it back. Yep. The dogs, they do a couple and Karaz jumps up and he catches yep. it. 
is the value of the dropout as much as it was before this season, before the change of rules? You, know, you used to be guaranteed, all right, we've got another set. Just drop it in, we'll get another set. Nowadays, you're not guaranteed to get the ball back. Yeah. I, like, when I, like, the back end of my career, I really... I enjoyed the short dropout because as a middle player, you don't have to run all the way down the other end of the field. You know what I mean? For them for them to run 20 metres back and still be, you know, just off your line anyway. So I just thought, well, why wouldn't you just challenge for a 50-50? Back then, it was, it was a penalty if you went, if you went, didn't go the right distance. Now, like, there, is, there isn't much reward for the person that fails to kick at 10 metres. No. You know, so... These guys are, are braving it, and hence why Drinkwater is doing the little ones as well. Like he's, I've seen him do it a few times, even off kickoffs and get the ball back. So yeah. he was very lucky to knock that ball on because the game was in the balance as well then, and obviously they score their try. But there is no reward unless you get the ball back for the the defending or the the attacking team if you have to kick yeah. it over. You know what I mean? So. Teams are getting better at it. Teams are getting better at making sure the ball gets the right distance, but also teams are getting better at diffusing it as well. So it has become more, it is 50-50 every time you do it, but the reward of getting a penalty in front was, it was stopping the guys from doing those short kickers if you weren't good at it. So now it doesn't matter. You, you, you go short and it doesn't go long. It's just to play the ball at worst. So... I think there's there's no reward for having a, a well no reward for the team that's trying to catch that ball. So you just kick short. Like I would just do that anyway because you just defend your line. Yeah. I feel like the closer you get to the line, the harder it is to attack. Yeah. Because defense is coming at you. So defense is flying off the line. So Bulldogs, for example, I think they were really good defending their line because gee, they were flying right up and a lot of them were getting right in the face of the the Cowboys. So the execution becomes more important for the Cowboys. And when they're playing their shape, there was a moment there near the end, they played some shape of bounce back, hit the ground. You know, they got rushed and then Josh Curran and William Kikau tackled yes. them back on the 30 yep. meter line. So you've gone from attacking 10 meters out to now getting attacking from 30, which I feel is a lot better because people have to make decisions. They have to go up and back, oh, well, not further, but the decision of if you're sitting on your line as a defensive uh, defensive centre or, or back rowers, then the attack's coming at you. So you want to be able to take the space off them. So there, I, I just feel like going short is more reward for the team that's going short than it is for the team that's trying to catch the ball unless you get it back. It's a no-lose situation. So it's a no-lose situation. So... Yeah, go short, and if you if yeah. you get it back, you get it back. If you don't, it's it's a, just to play the and ball. That's and that's what sort of led me to believe that, you know, in years prior to this, the dropout was valuable. Yes, you roll it in, tackle them in. Yeah, that's a big step. We get it back now. Now with nothing to lose, I just don't think. It's well, there was there was a moment there that um, near the end. Um, Ted Townsend runs down the left, or or no, Ted Townsend. Tommy Dearden goes down the sh or goes down a, a left hand side. Where I think there was like three or four minutes to go. He just gets tackled with the ball because Matt Burden was actually kicking them really well short, and they were getting the yep. ball back. So he's like, well, if I kick it, I go in and try and get a repeat, and Matt Burden kicks yeah, and they yeah. get the ball back. Well, would would rather just defend them right there. You know, like it's a there's no win. Got him in the corner. Yeah, there's no win anyway. So you either. Tackle them, yeah. you hand the ball over there and you tackle them there or you go, they give it to them. They may get the ball back anyway, but maybe 12 metres out. So there is no reward anymore for anything because if you're an attacking team, I guess you've got to just back yourself to be able to catch that ball. But Burden was kicking those no. drop kicks perfectly for, for Kraz and Kraz was getting up and leaping for no. them. So, yeah, I just, it's, yeah, back in... I suppose back those grubber kicks now have to be... Scoring opportunities. Well, they have to be scoring like opportunities like the, Bulldogs, like the Bulldogs are doing yeah. right now is they're putting those balls through and you want to be competing. You want yep. to be competing. You want to be hitting through the line and you don't want them to go seven. So you want to be in there diving on those balls and hopefully scoring tries or them hitting it out. But even then, yeah. it's a 50-50 when they do the dropout. So you want to be just putting pressure on the opposition every time you're kicking the ball in the end goal. Yeah. So, I suppose the, the traditionalist in me doesn't like the fact that they've taken away the penalty. Yeah, well, you like back then you had to be you had to be practicing the short dropouts. 
but we no one was no, no one was practicing the short dropouts now everyone's practicing it because it becomes a key part of the game now yep. if you can get that ball back and you've been defending your yeah. butts off for five sets you get that ball back that's a massive relief for your team so back in the day is that you had to perfect that which no one was practicing no. No one was practicing. You just give it to the guy no. that does the dropouts and hopefully he gets it right. If you don't get it right, then it's a penalty right in front of the sticks. Two points. That could be the difference of winning a game. Winning a game. So, you, sure. so your thought I process tried. your thought process goes from either I, I do a kick and it doesn't go doesn't go to 10, I get a penalty, or I kick long. That's why there was more long kicks than short kicks, eh? Because 100%. of the penalty. So there was a deterrent because if you get it wrong, it's a penalty. Yeah, short or out on the full. Yeah. So penalty right in front. Yep. Now that's now that's not a deterrent. There is no deterrent to the short kickoff of the short dropout. So everyone's doing it. And if it doesn't, like I've seen Latrell kick the ball out. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Most people do. But there's no problem with that. Oh well, we'll just defend our line. Yeah, we just defend our line. So yeah, it's it's a bit like that. Bit of a debatable one. There'd yeah. be nice to chuck this one up and see what people have to say. Hey, what do you reckon? Please do. Please, Please do. do. Hey, chuck that one up. Hide let's, my, let's, hide let's debate something here. The short the short dropout is it any good or not? See what you think about Koro yeah, well. this week. Koro Wurumu. <laughs> Give Koro Wurumu. Everyone, make sure you mention Koro Wurumu in your comments as well. He loves it. <laughs> Before we head off for this episode, uh, just an update on your guys' scores for your predictions. So, Adam, you're six out of seven. Willie, you're four out of seven. How much, how much was I? Sorry, you just cut out a bit then. Six, oh, out, six of out of seven. Oh, gee, gee, oh, no, I should, I should do this all the time. Nah, don't, don't, don't listen to me. I might start betting, eh? Nah, don't. Yeah, nah, start getting a multi, mate. Get it all together. Got a multi. Get some funding yeah. for the show, you know. Yeah, you know? I would have been one short, and my my first game would have been gone. There's my multi gone. <laughs> filthy, <laughs> filthy for the rest of the weekend. Yeah. Is, is, is that, that us? From? Sure. Is, I guess it is. I guess it is us. <laughs> hey, it's good to see you, Dills. It's all the way good to see you. Hey, boys. All the way over in Samoa. Yeah. Um, another beautiful, <laughs> another beautiful episode of Rugby League Round Twenty. What a wrap up that was. Um, some great games. Uh, make sure you tune in to all our socials. We'll be chucking up some videos where you guys can comment again. Make sure you mention Koro Urumu in there as well and, and give them some <laughs> feedback. Uh, we love you guys. Keep tuning in. Subscribe. Come into our YouTube channel as well. Run it straight. Uh, thank you again for another episode. See you again next week. Let's go.